We were on an open studio in Brooklyn Navy Yards, and we were just fascinated by his work. Um, and we got into this discussion with him, which was incredible after, I don't know, it just went on and on. <laughs> and it came out that he, has this, he had this secret dual life as um, this expert in precious gems. Um, he works... He worked for many years um, at the Gemological Institute of America, um, which is a uh, not-for-profit organization. Um, and they, they grade diamonds and do amazing things like this. So, for example, um, John brought in all this amazing um, knowledge that he had, and he created actually a color system to grade diamonds, which is pretty amazing. And he's been so, he's so renowned in this work that they've had him recently, just couple, what was it, a month ago, come into the Natural History Museum in New York to overwatch the Okavanga Blue Diamond, which is from Botswana. And I don't know how many carats did it have, or? 20. 20, <laughs> yeah. 20 yeah. So pretty incredible. And he is also responsible for actually the, the first ever in a team to grade the Hope Blue Diamond. So it's pretty incredible. Um, but we are amazed at his work, most of all, that he's done. And he has been recipient of many awards and is in um, many collections in the Brooklyn Museum and all these other institutions. So today we're having him, we're so excited to have him and we're so excited that people are here and don't be shy. We would love to have conversation as opposed to just a typical artist talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So kind, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. You let let me know if I'm speaking loud enough for everybody in the back. Um, I'm getting thumbs up, so I guess we're okay. As uh, as Lisa and Reinhold noted, I uh, met them at my studio at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And uh, we had great conversations. I finally, two years later, managed to come up here and see this space. And while here, uh, Reinhold said, well, you know, we'd like to do a show with you. And I think you can imagine standing in the space and seeing the art that they were showing. I said, yes. <laughs> because it just, it had a kind of magical quality. It really kind of captivated me. And I, uh, I realize that has always been important to me in my artwork and, and the way I approach my art. Um, some of the earliest pieces in the exhibit are hotel stationery drawings in the other room. And the earliest ones were from 1995. And I started those and I always felt, oh, these are a, a little side part of my, my work, you know, kind of like if I do anything here, it doesn't really matter because it's not the main body of work. And I've learned over time that that's not necessarily the case, that it was really much more central than I first thought because they tend to be about this feel and experience that I haven't had before. Being in a new space, kind of seeing things differently, sometimes not fully understanding those things. And uh, they kind of captured those moods, those feelings. And I think that was kind of what starts coming through for me in general, these, these situations where you see a revealing a form or you're trying to find a form in your work. And to me, kind of at the core of that, what I've learned over time is that comes about through a quality of light, you know, how light's revealing something. Uh, and I'm you know, sort of interested in it from the most shadowy depth, you know, from some of the mono prints that are in the pass-through barn above, I purposefully wanted those in because they're so hard to see. You know, some, and most of people are probably saying, why can't you get better lighting on this? But they really are very, very subtle. And my desire there is to have the viewer understand a different level of observation that's required to see that subtlety then be able to jump around and take that kind of idea to the paintings which have a lot more activity, a lot more going on, but to bring that level of intense 
observation. And I, you know, I, I said to Lucette at one point, you know, my gemological career and my art career, early on, I kind of kept them at arm's length. And I, I have dear friends here, I'm very happy to say, who knew me in my earliest days in New York. And it wouldn't surprise me that for a while they didn't really know that, what job I had. Because I didn't tend to talk about it a whole lot. Um, but again, what I found is it brought together many of the same concerns, which was intense uh, observation, a kind of meditative quality while working, um, general kind of overall views as well as detail. Uh, the surface, looking into an object, looking at the surface, looking through it, seeing these strange, hard to define forms starting to come through uh, in these gems, and what did they mean, and how, what did they tell you, are things that I found I was just kind of naturally bringing into my drawings and paintings. Uh, because it was always interesting to me uh, to be on that edge, that kind of edge of recognition, where you begin to know a form, where not. Because I think that is where you're most heightened in your observations. So that's always been a goal to come across. Um, I, the work you see here uh, spans from 2009 to 2022. I believe probably close to half the work is uh, what, what I consider recent work, uh, probably 19, 2019 to 2022. But I also thought uh, to really understand this interest in this quality of life, the, the way forms are coming together, it would be useful to understand that it's not something that just happened at the start of the first piece in the show. That this has been something that's kind of spanned throughout my career. And uh, I, I remember now I can think back of drawings I was doing 40 years ago uh, when I was making paper, and I would make I would make these slabs that were probably half an inch thick, and then I would push pastel into the surface, and of course that dry material wouldn't totally go into everything, and you'd get this little white read through, and you see that still happening today. The way you kind of play with light kind of emanating from that surface has always intrigued me, and I think it uh, is, a, is a way, you know, kind of a metaphor for how we're seeing and what we're seeing in the environment, and, and a way we can pay attention to all these kinds of different qualities of light. Um, I found it really intriguing for myself, anyway, when I realized I was showing in the Hudson Valley, and I, uh, you know, was immediately thinking Hudson River School, and the first paintings I responded to, I would say, before I knew anything of art history, uh, was, you know, Frederick Church, you know, uh, Beardstadt, uh, Fritz Hugh Lane, you know, Thomas Cole, and I couldn't have told you why, but I think now I kind of know that that quality that they were after, this idea of the sublime, this idea of uh, nature in art uh, probably struck me, rang true to some degree. Now, if you if you ask me, do I have a relationship to those painters today? I would say no. I'm a hundred and eighty degrees opposite. Um, where my quality of light is coming from is not directly within nature all the time. It's often it's an artificial light many times. It's a photographic light, but but the quality and the sense that I think we observers bring to that is still the same. The feeling it can give us, the kind of depth of feelings, I think are still there uh, when you're dealing with these things. And I, I've been really uh, intrigued to kind of think about all those differences as I've begun to work. Um, the, the works here are all encaustic paintings on wood panels, uh, the drawings span medium a little bit. Um, a lot of graphite drawings, a lot of combinations of leads with graphite, um, and some colored pencil. Uh, the colored pencil I really like a lot because 
Uh, it too, like wax, is a kind of waxy material that lends itself really well to blending. Um, and I think that you know, I'm able to kind of span that kind of use for color that way. And it's brought color into the drawings in a way that I hadn't used for a long time. Uh, around the start of some of these drawings, which would be 2009, I was really intrigued what I could get by, you know, like these two here, what I, what I called colorful graphite drawings, just through different lens. You know, the, the feel one can get from uh, a 4H lead versus a 6B is a completely different color, as well as, uh, you know, touch. So I played off those a lot, and I really, um, there's probably two years where all I did was graphite drawings, you know, on paper. Uh, as I started coming back painting more, you know, there were qualities that I would have seen in that paper and the way the read through of the paper occurred that intuitively started coming through in the paintings. Uh, the paintings are layered uh, for months. And uh, it's funny, I've, I've said to people, the paintings are really thick. And I realize I'm probably using a wrong word um, there, there's many layers of liquid applied. So it has that kind of processing. It's thick in its processing. And I've always kind of like liked what starts to happen in the paintings. And I think uh, perhaps as we go up to uh, pass through where there's more paintings, you'll, you'll begin to see this, where um, the wax, when it hits the wood panel, will absorb differently across the surface. And it will absorb in in some areas where with a second or third stroke, and if you think about it, it's not now quite as hot as the first stroke. And it will begin to lay differently on the panel. And by doing this, and I'm just kind of working quickly with, you know, kind of arm motion, uh, I begin to get a kind of built up tactile surface. Um, and that keeps going through the process. And it's this process of kind of going from active, whether it be drawings, more, what I refer to as more arm movement, and starting to find the space of the paper or the panel, begin to understand the, the scale I'm working on, and to begin to find the forms that I want to work with. I begin to really sketch all that out. And then as they continue to develop, the refinement comes in and, and they slow and they, they go more slowly and the movements become more concentrated and my distance from the piece becomes closer like with the diamond I'm closer to really see it so that my buildup becomes more wrist movement um, until finally you know I can go a day and end up with like three touches to the, to the piece. Uh, they're very slow for me in building them. I think they're also slow reads. And um, I hope people are able to see that and appreciate it. Uh, they take time and I think that uh, that is one of the things that intrigues me and that I work toward in the making. So that there's built up of color, layers, translucencies that by the prolonged observation, you begin to see more. You begin to see into that surface. You begin to see that there's more colorful things going on than maybe at first glance. Um, those are all, I think, really important to understand how you know I would approach an object, how I see these things, uh, how, to me, they become mesmerizing in, in how I want to look at them. And I want to convey that experience, which is more meditative. Uh, I think over time. Um, I may not have mentioned, many of you might already know this, but just in case there's some who don't, the, the, I said they're all encaustic paintings, and encaustic is a wax-based painting medium. Uh, it's uh, purified beeswax that's mixed with a small percentage, I usually use maybe 15% Damara resin, and uh, I use powdered pigments. And this is heated on a heat source uh, in you know, tens to liquefy. Um, over the years, I've applied it many different ways. I've done series of works where I would literally take the, the, 
you know, liquefied tins and just pour it onto panels uh, and let it solidify, pour layer after layer. Um, usually I am using a brush and I'm brushing these layers on, as I said earlier about this buildup of, of a surface and how it hits the surface differently. But that's uh, what I'm talking about that when I'm saying it's heated. And the first stroke, of course, is the hottest because it's coming directly from the tin and that lays down differently than others will lay down. So depending on the amount of time between my taking a brush with the paint onto the brush and applying it, I know I can get a different effect in terms of surface luster. And so I try to kind of be aware of that, play off of it as I build form and build surface. Um, I work, you know, some of the pieces uh, I find the forms as I start painting. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not unusual to start with some reference, something I see in the studio, uh, photographs, sometimes fragments of photographs. I, uh, when I, I did a, a large show of work in 2008 out at uh, Santa Barbara City College. And when I came back from that show, I was really trying to think about where I wanted to go. And uh, some of the pieces in this show were the, the initial jumping off point from that return, which was drawing. Uh, I did drawings for the next two years. And the work from that previous show, I would, feel right saying it had more of a suggested narrational quality to the works, uh, sometimes more recognizable forms. I feel like I, in many instances, um, embedded those more in the recent works so that uh, there's a little less of that kind of, is there a narrative going on? Is there some story behind this? To the point where the, the work, the piece itself is more of a suggestion. Of, of an event place, some, some space that I've been in, or that you are now entering into. Um, I build up these surfaces now in a way that I feel like I begin to, in some ways, remove my hand. Um, and I feel, in a way, I see that sometimes as a uh, more of a, and I nod to Stephen, it's almost more of a uh, Eastern kind of idea to kind of step back and step outside of the work. But I, I, uh, I read recently about uh, some of the luminist painters from the Hudson Valley and how that was a, a noted characteristic of their work. How unlike Frederick Church or Thomas Cole, that, you know, the much more Baroque gestures being totally visible in the work, uh, a painting by Martin Johnson Heed or a, maybe a Fritz Hugh Lane, had really taken the mark out for the most part. And in doing so, you allow the viewer to become part of the work and to become, to, for the story to come from them, less from me. So I'm the first viewer. I'm the one in the studio that it has to make sense to. I'm the one trying to discover what it all means. And that's often where a piece will come from. What is this, what is this trying to tell me? Uh, how can I learn? How can I learn about it by going deeper and, and doing this drawing? You know, this thing I'm looking at, why is this appealing to me? So I keep doing and doing to kind of discover those things. But then there's a point where I want that to be open for everyone else, for them to be able to enter it and find their their world in there as well. I think I think you look at these and you don't think, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, we'll find out later. Um, I don't necessarily think you would look and, and feel like it's a completely abstract painting. But I think that you kind of sense he may have been looking at something, or this is a some place he's been. There's, something suggested and I, I think that's a kind of nice place for you to enter to see these things it kind of unfolds as you as you look at it you know, yes your layers you know you have the your first impression and then you oh that needs like this i i'm seeing this now as 
tra- uh, like standing on an overpass and I'm looking at traffic. And before, when I first saw it, I was just I was kind of intrigued by it and I wanted to look close and I thought, oh, well, it's just abstract shape, so that's interesting. And then it and then it changed. Yeah. And suddenly there's movement. You suddenly sense, oh, maybe there's movement going on in those forms, and how you know the depth to it, and what how there's actually a space there. And then you're you know? like, well, what, what is this like? So it keeps it keeps leading you. There, so I, there there are a lot of layers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I find you know, and I think you will see things that sit on the surface, and then a sense that goes behind. And there's such a play of touch that comes with that. You know, I, I was saying to someone earlier. Um, there's there's a point here where it's like shoulder press into the paper and there's others that's like a feather touch and how you can have those talk to each other uh, is really important to me there's drawings on the back of this panel from the mid uh, teens 2014 and 2015 um, that were based on being in my studio Tim Yee here who has a studio down the hall from me uh, I know he would come in, he probably did it, because they were based on little tape fragments left all over the window. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were so odd and so suggestive and so random, he didn't pull them off well. But um, I just loved the way, you know, you could be seeing this surface, and then at night I could see my studio reflected behind me, and then I could see out into the Navy Yard, and those little fragments were floating forms. And of course, it sort of made me think of what I had been seeing all day, looking at a diamond. But there was such a nice quality of suggestiveness and, and being in that place. And I probably did uh, drawings and paintings for a couple of years based on my studio windows. And uh, you know, there's, there's work going on today uh, kind of building, I would say, off of the red painting and the drawing next to it on the other side of the panel right here. Uh, again, of this kind of interior space. And I know I've, I've said in the past to my friend Susan Young, who wrote the essay in the catalog for the show, um, you know, I find myself sometimes I'll, I'll have this scrap photograph that I've taken on a trip of this hotel room I was in, and I find you know, oh, that little scrap could be a whole thing in and of itself. And actually, if I looked at it another way, it also has its own voice and its own meaning and its own feel to it. And um, there's like a whole body of work that's coming out of this one photo. And I, I've done things where I've torn up a bunch of photos a few years ago and I was uh, I was ready to throw them all in the garbage. They were like tiny little pieces. I thought they were nothing. And then all of a sudden, as you would expect, I started playing around and pulled about 10 of them aside. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. This has potential. And I don't necessarily try to duplicate any of those things. But there's, as much as even looking outside right now, I'm seeing a quality of light. I see a quality to them. There's a mysterious form. There's a, a quality of light to them. And I find those are the things to me that are intriguing that I want to explore. And it's never like wanting to duplicate some of those pieces per se, but it is something that I find stimulating that I want to bring into the work. So I never feel like you're actually trying to, you know, make, oh, this is the guy who does drawings from fragments of photographs, you know, because it's not so much as simple as that. It's not as, you know, it's, it's a tool among many tools. But I think uh, it's important that we're always keeping our eyes open. You know, we're always looking for these things and what we find. So whether I find it in a fragment of a photograph, uh, a diamond I'm able to work with, it's, it's been pretty fantastic. Uh, my work in gemology, as Lisette said, has uh, really been very interesting for me and uh, has offered me you know, aesthetics that I never thought I would be able to experience. If I were to say a couple words about them, as I said early on, I really kept them at arm's length, but I really began to realize how, you know, they really fed off each other, you know, that, those qualities I've mentioned before. Uh, but to work with some of the, uh, really the,
finest gems in the world uh, was really a unique opportunity you know, to, to grade the Hope Diamond at the Smithsonian Institution or the Tiffany Diamond from Tiffany and Company, uh, some of the largest colorless, flawless diamonds that's been carved in the past 50 years uh, has been a real special opportunity. And I, I have always looked at those, those kinds of stones as works of art. And the things I've always talked to the people in the trade that I know uh, that I would talk about is I say, you know, diamonds like this should be shown in art museums, not just na not just natural history museums, because I think we should look at them like art objects, and it's slowly starting to happen. <laughs> it's a, uh, a good friend of mine was able to show a hundred carat star sapphire at a uh, show in the uh, Museum of Fine Arts, Houston in conjunction with a show of blue and white ceramics, uh, Persian ceramics. And it was amazing. Now, I would, you know, I could say, gems have been shown in art galleries throughout the years. It's not like it doesn't happen, but they're usually isolated in a gallery in a museum. I'm talking about the gem next to a painting, you know, the gem next to a drawing. How do those things, how does that start to cross-pollinate? And how do we think about those things, those odd juxtapositions, uh, are what I really am intrigued by. And uh, that has been my message to those in the industry. And then I also, for them, say, look, there's way of look, ways of looking at these gems that you know, we bring back to looking at paintings and drawings. Um, I wrote an article once uh, about you know, the grading of yellow diamonds and the, the method that one uses in a laboratory. And I talked about how, well, you know, this first is a bit of an overall gaze. And the analogy I used was, uh, you know, Seurat. So I reproduced a Seurat painting and I showed a detail of it and the moving back and how when you get real close, you see this scintillation, lots of different colors, all individual as you move away, you see a landscape, you see people. Um, so there's all of these things that I've been able to kind of move between and kind of talk about from these different aspects of my practices that I think uh, has been very rich in how they inform each other. Um, I'm happy to take any questions here. I thought we could also meander up to the other barns, which are more uh, painting, and maybe uh, I could talk more about the techniques that go on in the painting if that would work as well. John, yeah. I thought it might be interesting if you talk a little bit about your hotel stationery. Um, people can look at this, um, how it worked for you working on collaborations with poets and oh. other sorts of inspirations. Thank you, sure, sure. Um, as we said earlier, yes, I, I showed three of these sta stationary drawings because I have realized just how important they are within the work. Um, but there's no, about 200 of them. And I've been, uh, I've been stingy in wanting to hold them as a unit. So that's uh, right now, you know, I, I still foster this goal of seeing them go from some place as a group. Uh, but early on, I had done the first 28. I started in, I said, as I mentioned, in 1995. Um, I did one when I was out in California and I threw it in a sketchbook and didn't think much about it. A um, couple years later, I happened to be somewhere and did another one. All of a sudden, I found over a two or three year period, I had maybe four or five of these, and I thought, there's something interesting going on here. It's really capturing something about these trips that are special to me. So I, I decided at that point, I would be very diligent, and I would start doing it every time I traveled. Uh, that was starting to be the point uh, in my career when I was beginning to travel a lot for GIA and uh, really going all over the world. So it was a combination of some personal travel as well as travel for, for work. But when I had the first 28 of them, I uh, had gone to visit a very dear friend of mine at the time, a, a significant collector of drawings. His name was Werner Kromarski in New York City. And, uh, you know, when was looking at my drawings, we were sitting at his office and 
he was going through this portfolio of these 28 hotel stationary drawings. And, uh, you know, with when it's like dead silent as he's looking at these things. And I, uh, I'm like, Panic. did I do the right thing? Uh, but he, uh, you know, he's looking and I kind of said, you know, I always thought I wanted to do something else with these. And, you know, without missing a beat, Wen looks up and he goes, yeah, a book. And I said, well, if I were going to do a book, I think it should have some sense of correspondence. You know, it's like stationary. And again, he just goes, ah, Bill Corbett, I'll give you his contact info before you leave. You know, he's a poet up in Boston. So uh, I contacted Bill, because if Wen says contact Bill, I contact Bill. <laughs> and uh, he, I wrote to him and I told him what I was hoping to do. And he wrote back and said, I'm interested in this. Here's what I suggest. Each day you send me a facsimile of one of the drawings. Don't, see him. Don't send the original. Mail me a facsimile. And every day when I receive it, I'll write a poem. And when I'm done, I'll send them to you. And so we didn't want to get into a whole lot of detail, talk very much in detail with each other. He, I found, like I, in responding to the doing the drawings, wanted just like to respond to what he saw, bring in a little bit of what he'd been doing that day, whatever it may be. And uh, he did the 28 poems. Um, when I saw them, it's like, I have to publish this. You know, So we published a book that became known as Return Receipt. Uh, and I started with the uh, correspondence between Bill and myself and end it uh, with the last drawing that uh, you know, Bill wrote about. So I uh, continued to have a very good friendship with Bill until he passed away in 2018. Um, and we did other projects together. He wrote an essay for a show I did out in California. He had me do drawings for some of his chapbooks. Um, so it's, and poetry has been very important to me over the years. I mean, I started, uh, took some poetry classes back as a, a student and you know, I've always responded to poetry. Sometimes titles come from words in a poem or a line in a poem. Um, I've always found it very rich. So to have that relationship is very strong. And he introduced me to a number of other people in his circle, which was uh, all has been and continues to be very rewarding over the years. And I like those things. I like having opportunities for for collaborative times with other people. You know, to, to work with Bill, share something like that was very special. Every few years I go into the print shop and I try to do like a new etching or something like that because I, I find it it's a way of having to think differently, do things a little differently, um, force yourself outside of the box. So um, all those things I think are very valuable. Although I will say you know, the, the major majority of the work comes uh, in the studio and it's a long, it's drawings and paintings. I find, look, you know, people have mentioned other artists. I've talked a lot about Hudson River School painters. I've talked about Seurat. All very important to me. Um, when I was at Hunter, we had uh, a number of amazing people on staff at the time. Um, I was fairly close with a painter named Ron Gorchov and another Ralph Humphrey, but the entire faculty was very enriching. Uh, they've all meant a lot to me. I've also said to people, I, I kind of feel though, when I go in the studio, I'm closing the door and just, uh, I'm, I'm alone. Um, and I'm just working. And I'm trying to figure out first for me. I'm trying to understand whatever experiences I'm having. I'm sure those other people come in because we have shared interests. We like looking at similar things. So naturally, we would have things that we would share. But um, it really is that kind of interest in discovery, whether it's been the research I've been able to do with gems or the kind of digging that goes on when you're trying to understand in a creative process in this practice. <laughs> would, would that be uh, yeah. why don't we walk up and uh